Yeah, thank you very much, Giz. Um, so yeah, first off, uh, I'd like to thank um, the Company of Biologists for organizing such a wonderful uh, seminar and also for giving me the opportunity to present my work uh, today. So yeah, I'll, I'll be focusing on uh, branching morphogenesis uh, in the pancreas and um, how uh, matrix remodeling and cell rearrangements are, um, are uh, taking a, a huge part in this process. Um, so uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, in the developmental biology community, uh, the pancreas has a beautifully um, branched architecture composed for the exocrine part um, by acina cells, which uh, secrete digestive enzymes, uh, which are transported via um, ducts to the duodenum, where they play the um, digestive function. So when I started uh, my postdoc in the lab of uh, Francesca Spagnoli at King's College London, um, a question that was um, very much open in, in the field was uh, how does the, this organ, which originates from the forgot endoderm and forms um, an epithelium uh, composed of two domains, a pro and pro domain, how is it transformed into these um, elaborate architectures where um, many branches are all branches are terminated by uh, asini and um, are uh, sit sitting on top of uh, ramified um, branches. So the, the focus of my postdoc uh, was to try and identify the cellular rearrangement as well as the developmental signals and potential matrix remodeling uh, at play during this process. Now, of course, um, this is important for uh, fundamental uh, fundamental que uh, questions of uh, pancreas development, but also uh, we thought it could extrapolate to uh, other branch organs as um, kind of um, beautifully shown before uh, by Paolo in, in, in the branch, uh, in the in the lung uh, branches, as well as other organs like the salivary gland, for example. And also um, understanding these design principles could really be uh, informative for future um, tissue replacement strategies for a uh, pancreatic graph, for example. So um, to study that question, I mostly use a pancreatic explant that could be collected uh, from um, embryos at E12.5 and cultured um, in vitro to perform live um, imaging um, uh, analysis and drug perturbation uh, assays. So. Um, by doing this and mosaically labeling uh, ductile cells, um, we're very surprised to see that um, ductile cells are actually very dynamic uh, in the epithelium. They can send protrusions toward the base me membrane and retract this protrusion in a sort of uh, probing um, behavior. And then uh, on some occasions, these um, uh, the retraction of these protrusion leads to the formation of clefts uh, in the epithelium, which might be easier to see here in these uh, still images with the white arrow. So to try to understand, um, and I'm not sure you're seeing my um, pointer. So, uh, yeah. So to try to understand um, how these uh, ductal protrusions are forming this cleft uh, in the epithelium, I perform uh, immunostaining on, on, on tissue. And uh, what I realized is that Whenever a cleft is formed, there's always uh, at least one ductal cell um, sitting below here in red osteopontin positive uh, ductal cells. And the retraction of the protrusion is leading to um, the invagination of the base me membrane here stained in blue by a uh, laminin staining. So an invagination of the base me membrane in between acinar cells. So this protrude and pull mechanism uh, is able to um, pull the, the, the base membrane in between acinar cells and start splitting the uh, anacinus uh, in two. And uh, what we also observed is that these clefts can be uh, further stabilized by more ductal cells joining into, um, in, in, in getting in contact with the base membrane. And that leads, this leads to the enlargement uh, of the clefts and also here uh, on the lower panel, as we can see four ductal cells uh, joining, at some point, these ductal cells um, change from this teardrop shape to more cubital cells. And by enlarging the cleft, uh, form a new ductal segment, uh, definitely splitting the acinus uh, in two. 
So to try to understand uh, what mechanical forces the ductile cells are applying to, to pull the basement membrane and, and form clefts, I performed uh, live imaging with an actin uh, dye, seractin. And uh, what we observe is that at the site of cleft formation, there is a strong enrichment in F-actin in the protrusion of uh, ductile cells. And so when we perturb uh, actomyosin contractility using a ROC uh, inhibitor, we observe um, a very strong decrease in the number of uh, clefts that are formed in the epithelium, highlighting that actomyosin contractility uh, in uh, the ductile cells need to be, seems to be key for, um, for a cleft formation. And what we also observe, interestingly, is that when cleft were uh, already formed at the beginning of uh, the live uh, imaging, most of them were lost upon rock inhibition, showing that the actomyosin contractility needs to be maintained for some time for, for, for cleft to, to be stabilized and later be transformed into a uh, branch bifurcation. So uh, overall, what these results um, show is um, that ductal cells that are localized um, at the, the tip of, of uh, branches are able to protrude in between acinar cells, pull the base membrane, and split uh, acinar in two. So this first phase is active uh, matrix remodeling, and the second phase involves uh, these ductile cell rearrangements that transform the cleft, enlarge it, and transform it in a, in a ductile bifurcation. So we then wanted to know what uh, developmental signals might be regulating uh, this process and the, act the ability of these ductile cells to um, regulate branching morphogenesis. So we focused on the PI3 kinase pathway as uh, it was described in other organs to be able to uh, regulate cell cell rearrangement. And so what we observe um, by um, inhibiting by inhibiting the PI3 kinase pathway with a drug uh, called LY, we observe a significant increase in the number of clefts, which actually coincides with um, an increase in the number of uh, acini and a decrease in, in their size, so meaning that more clefts uh, uh, leads to overfragmentation of um, the acini. Whereas uh, when we overactivated the, the pathway with the BPV, we observed the opposite, so fewer clefts in the epithelium and enlarged uh, acini. So our results really show that the PIS weekend pathway seems to be um, uh, able to regulate um, the, the clefting and the ability of ductal cells uh, to form clefts in the epithelium. Uh, but surprisingly, so these were uh, only 24 hours treatment when we tried to treat the extent for longer time periods to see the effect on the gross uh, morphology of the, the extent and their branching um, um, morphologies. What we observe is that uh, by doing a long term inhibition of LY, so 48 hours instead of uh, 24 hours with, with what I showed before, um, we didn't see more, more cleft didn't, didn't induce more branches, but instead we observed that here in green, most of the acini were lost uh, in the explants. And we quantified as well the number of lateral branches here in the periphery regions in blue and quantified on the right. And we observed a decrease in, in lateral branches. So what our results show is that um, uh, too much clefting leads to uh, acini uh, apoptosis loss of acini and defects in uh, branching. And the long-term overactivation of the PIH kinase pathway by BPV, which I showed causes uh, enlarged acini. In the long term, this enlarged acini transdifferentiate back uh, into ductile cells and create ductile cysts. So overall, what uh, our results show is that PIH kinase pathway needs to be uh, finely regulated um, for the branching morphogenesis to happen properly. If PIH kinase is inhibited, we observe an increase in clefting, but these clefts are not transformed into um, um, uh, branch bifurcating branches uh, by uh, a mechanism that I'll, I'll explain later. And so too much clef clefting leads to the loss of the acini and, and defects uh, in uh, morphological defect and branch branching defects. Uh, and on the um, other hand, the overactivation leads to enlarged acini, uh, disruption of, of their architecture, and these enlarged acini become cystic ducts. So the, the, the next question we, we wanted to address is uh, what 
signals are actually uh, acting upstream of PSU kinase and, and, and tuning its activation in ductile cells. So by mining um, single cell RNA seq data, um, we observe that the IGF-1 receptor is highly enriched in ductile cells, and we actually um, see it very clearly by immunostaining here in red, where uh, cells, ductile cells expressing the NKX 6.1 transcription factor also highly expressed IGF-1R. And the uh, cognate cognate ligand IGF-1 is um, uh, specifically enriched in the uh, acinar cells localized um, close to the ductile cells, suggesting that IGF-1 signals from the acinar cells uh, um, um, are activating IGF um, uh, downstream pathways in the ductile cells. And uh, this is what uh, we see by looking at the uh, downstream, uh, the activation of the downstream effector of the igf ps pathway, pathway, uh, phospho-AKT, um, phospho where we see a strong co-localization between phospho-SKT um, staining and IGF-1R staining in the ductile cells. So to try and, and really uh, see if IGF uh, signals are major, the major regulators of uh, PSU kinase uh, activity in ductile cells, we uh, specifically inhibited IGF-1R using an, uh, the linzitinib drug. And we observe that when we treat the experiment with this drug, we see a very strong defect in, in um, phospho AKT, so in the uh, PSU kinase um, signaling. And also um, that specifically targeting the IGF-1 uh, receptor with this drug is uh, enabling a rescue of the phenotype of the PSU kinase um, overactivation phenotype caused by BPV, which, as I said, is causing the formation of cysts. So if we co-treat the, the exponent with uh, the linzitinib and BPV, we see a rescue of the cystic phenotype, really showing that uh, IGF-1R receptor seems to be critically uh, acting above uh, PSU kinase activation in ductile cells. I should uh, also mention that in terms of uh, morphological defect, linzitinib um, treatment leads to similar defect as the LY treatment, so as the um, uh, PSV kinase inhibition, uh, meaning defects uh, over fragmentation of the SNI and um, lateral branching defects. So we to, to, to make sure that these drug perturbations um, were uh, actually uh, real and not artifactual. We also specifically um, uh, deleted the uh, IGF-1 receptor uh, by using the, the pancreas-specific uh, pancreas PDX1 CRE. And we also observe both uh, ex vivo here on the uh, top panel and, and in vivo in the lower panel, over fragmentation of uh, the SNI and uh, as well in vivo uh, defects uh, in branching here shown by light sheet imaging where we saw very um, long branches with um, devoid of uh, lateral branches and sometimes in some regions also devoid of acini, which are re really reminiscent of the PSG kinase inhibition uh, on explants. So yeah, uh, overall IGF and uh, PSV kinase uh, pathway seems to be uh, really key for uh, regulating the ability of ductile cells to um, regulate uh, branching, uh, but how is it uh, regulating the, the ability to, to tune branching morphogenesis? So to try and understand this uh, better, I am, I uh, again did uh, some stainings for um, actomyosin and specifically here for uh, phosphomyosin in ductile cells. And we observe that by when we inhibit um, the PSV kinase pathway, we see a decrease in phosphomyosin in the ductile cells, whereas when we overactivate the PSV kinase pathway, we see an increase in phosphomyosin, but also a relocalization of phosphomyosin on the basal side of ductile cells, so a mis kind of mislocalization of uh, phosphomyosin. And so how does this translate in terms of cell uh, behavior? So by, um, again, doing um, cell tracking in expand and mosaically labeling uh, ductile cells, we observe that when phosphomyosin is downregulated uh, due to PSV kinase uh, inhibition, cells are much more uh, static and um, are much less able to rearrange. Whereas when we overactivate the pathway, cells move uh, uncontrollably and erratically in the epithelium and are causing what, and we think are, um, is the reason for causing the perturbation, the alteration in, in the acinar compartment and the formation of, of the cysts. 
So uh, overall, what our um, results are highlighting is that um, there's a, a two-phase uh, mechanism. First, the matrix remodeling step where ductal cells are able to protrude and pull to form cleft in uh, the epithelium. And later, uh, these uh, clefts needs to be stabilized um, by a rearrangement of the ductile cells, which um, seems to be uh, regulated by the igf ps uh, pathway. Where if this pathway is inhibited, we see an increase in the formation of clefts, but these clefts cannot be um, cannot be transformed into bifurcations. So this leads to overfragmentation of the acini and uh, overall uh, branching defects. And when the pathway is overactivated with the uh, un uncontrollable cell cell rearrangements, leading to um, uh, the formation of ductal cysts. And um, so our results, um, we think, are also important because they could um, extrapolate to um, the formation of other branch organs uh, as uh, potentially salivary glands and uh, lungs or kidneys. So we also we want to we want to investigate that further. And also we think they could be leveraged uh, in in vitro, for example, to make. Um, highly branched uh, organoids uh, with more physiological relevance. So with that, uh, I would like to, to thank the lab in which I've, I've done this work, the um, uh, lab of French Spagnoli and the help of Anna and uh, Alejo for some of the, the expand cultures, as well as the lab of uh, Garcia Menias, uh, with whom I've done some uh, atomic force microscopy experiments that I haven't had the time to share today. But uh, thank you for your attention as well, and happy to take any question. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul, for us. That was a very, uh, very beautiful talk. Thank you indeed. Um, can I just remind the um, people who are watching online that some people are putting questions into the chat box and other people are typing them into the Q&A, so um, either one, I'll, I'll try and keep my eye out. Um, so our first question Using your system, is it possible to measure the force the protrusions need to pull the base, basement membrane into a cleft? So uh, it's uh, what we've been doing with the, the lab of uh, Garcia Menias. Um, and uh, maybe I can show just this slide. Uh, yeah, so we have been able to use uh, atomic force microscopy to try and measure the rigidity of um, of the cells in the, the acina compartment and at cleft site, and we see yeah actually um, strong increase um, in the tissue stiffness at cleft site, which we think is coming from the increased tension from the cells that are the ductus that are uh, pulling the basement membrane at the cleft site. Um, so yeah, we see. Um, we don't see a, like a, a massive increase, not like a twofold increase, but we see a significant difference. Uh, so yeah, this is what we've been able to to demonstrate. <laughs> so a, a quick follow up question. So you describe these protrusions as pulling the basement membrane. So yeah. how does that work? I mean, how does it attach to that uh, focal part of the basement membrane? Yeah. And yeah, I mean uh, that, that's uh, what we want to investigate further for now. So what we what we see is that um, the position of these um, so that the protrusions are seem to be very dynamic. We see that they can uh, ha uh, yeah be formed and retract, and, yeah. and and we observe that um, only in some occasion this leads to the pulling of the basement membrane. Uh, it's quite challenging to do the live imaging. So it's very easy to see them on tissue section, especially at 16.5. We see them in 30% of the of the, the acini. Mm -hmm. But when we do mosaic labeling, we have only 4% chance of, uh, uh, I mean, only 4% of the cells are I recombined. See. So it's very rare yeah. to, to be to to be hitting the one that's actually contributing like pulling um but our uh, hypothesis right now is that we see that the very the bigger acini have a seem to have a thinner basement membrane so what i think might be happening is that there is an intrinsic uh, um, physical uh, parameter, which is that when acini get big enough, their basement membranes become become thinner because it's secreted by the ducts, and so they might be more deformable. Uh, and so it would mean that uh, intrinsically bigger acini might be more prone to being uh, splitted, uh, split. 
So, I mean, this is the hypothesis that we are working on um, and that I will be work, working on in the future. Yeah. Great. Okay, so our next question, um, which is related to our first one about um, measuring the forces. Um, to what extent does your explant culture system recapitulate the mechanical properties of the in vivo um, system and setting? Yeah, um, of course. So I think, uh, yeah, there, there are some um, disadvantages for sure of um, the uh, explant. So, um, I mean, uh, the, the simple answer, I guess, is like uh, for now, it's the best system that we have. Because the the um, the organoid the pancreatic organoids I mean I've been also working on on that, but um, they they don't really recapitulate the um, the tip trunk uh, differentiation and they don't have a beautiful acini polarized. Um, so I mean it's maybe in the future we'll have a full three D model available, but uh, it's true that the explants are kind of semi two uh, D because they are growing on a flat surface, yep. and uh, of course they are on a stiffer step substrate than the in vivo um, stroma but we think that um if like that looking because they are still growing quite high uh in in uh, in z so looking at the at the, the upper part of the explant is still giving a very good it's still a very good tool uh to to study a branching morphogenesis Okay, so Paolo um, has commented, great talk. In the lung, clefting is associated with smooth muscle actin positive cells. And does the same happen in the pancreas? Do you think there's any uh, cross talk with a PI3 chi K pathway? Yeah, I mean, uh, initially when I was working on this, of course, I was inspired by, uh, yeah, worked in, in the lung, in the lab, lab of uh, Celeste Nelson uh, and others. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've been really trying to see um, if uh, smooth muscle cells or cells with uh, contractility were localized at um, close to clefts, and I've really never been able to to, to see that. So um, there might be, of course, an, an effect of um, the uh, subpopulation of the mesenchyme. But in the pancreas, the smooth muscle cells really uh, are only um, localized around big vessels, which are quite far from, from the cleft. So what we think is that really that the mechanism is, is quite different from the lung which kind of makes sense because the rheology of the tissue is very different since it's not filled with air but with uh, mucus right, right. <laughs> so um, yeah no, uh, we don't think that most muscles are actively uh, playing a, a role uh, in clefting and, and branching um but then i mean they, they might play a role later uh, during differentiation or morphogenesis so then I have one last question about the IGF-1 connection. So you showed very nicely with the, the localized de deletion of the IGF-1 receptor. But in the, you know, the, there's lots of kind of whole global mutant mice running around. So in the IGF-1 mutant mice, do they have defects in uh, branching morphogenesis? Or is it yeah. such a kind of pleiotropic pattern? That there are other growth factors which can kind of compensate mm. and you know there's kind of some kind of homeostasis at work that, that's yeah, also yeah. helping regulate how many um times that the ductal cells actually branch the acini yeah. so i i didn't really have time to to delve uh, into that but we actually see so the lindsay tilip drug uh, shows a stronger phenotype and it's targeting igf1r and insulin receptor um okay. It's there. There was a double uh, knockout um, um, mut mutant embryos published uh, quite a long time ago, and they seem to have a very strong uh, defect. Uh, so it's true that here, when we specifically, we think there might be a compensation um, when we delete IGF-1R by uh, the by um, um, expression of the insulin receptor. Uh, yeah. We were written. The, the tools to study the insulin receptor are much more sparse than the IGF-1R, so we are not really able to re really um, yeah, study this in, in detail. But yes, uh, the short answer is, I think, um, although in the normal context, insulin receptor doesn't seem to be expressed in ductile cell, I think it might be um, uh, re-expressed in, in the case of the IGF-1R specific mutant. Yeah. 